Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Alison Harris. Good afternoon. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to revisit the granting of third party rights of appeal in planning applications. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the introduction of a third party right of appeal in the planning system has been considered on a number of occasions, including in our recent independent review of planning, which did not support such a change. Our ongoing consultation focuses on strengthening engagement early in the planning process rather than introducing new appeal rights after a decision has been made. Alison Harris. Um, well, is the Minister aware that many individuals and community groups feel that the planning system is loaded too much in favour of the applicant? You know, where is the fairness where an applicant can appeal against a refusal to grant planning consent by a local authority? The same right is not given to objectors should the planning consent be granted. What, what is the government planning to do about this further? Minister. President Officer, um, we want more decisions to be made locally. Um, and expanding the range of applications that can be delegated and made subject to local review procedures means decisions will be taken at the lowest local level. Um, the proposals that are identified in the consultation uh, and from the independent review uh, identify more meaningful early collaboration uh, will ensure that that is the case. I am very keen uh, to make sure uh, that uh, we become much more focused uh, in ensuring that community planning and spatial planning comes together. I think that that is the best way to deal with all of this, rather than to uh, have even more centralisation uh, and ministers having to decide uh, on applications. With the use of uh, new technologies, I think that we can do much uh, to improve that system. Uh, and I hope uh, that Ms Harris uh, will respond to the current consultation uh, and will encourage all of her constituents to do likewise. Alec Rowley. Uh, President officer, whilst the review itself did not recommend equal right to appeal and the government um, turned down any, or ruled out any equal right appeal, it is true that those who commented, particularly community organisations and groups, were in favour of an equal right to appeal. And in order for this process and consultation to have the public confidence, then does the Minister agree that we need to be able to answer the question, if there is no equal right of appeal, why is there any right to appeal at all? Um, and what rights will be in place for communities? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Our proposals reflect the independent review following very widespread uh, public consultation uh, and the focus on improving performance and confidence uh, in the system. Uh, we also have to ensure uh, that there is confidence in achieving the sustainable economic growth that we all want for Scotland. I think the most important thing, as I, I said to Ms Harris, uh, is to make sure that we get this right at the earliest possible uh, part of the process rather than appeals at the end. Uh, and that is why I am so keen to ensure that we can uh, en engage communities uh, through community planning and bring spatial planning into that uh, so that they have their say at that particular point in time. I think that all of that is entirely viable and I think that that is the best way forward. However, the government will listen uh, to what people have to say during the course of the current consultation. Question number two, Maurice Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assurance it can give communities that objections to proposed developments will be fully considered in the appeals process, given the reported 25% increase in the last year in the number of local authority planning rejections overruled by ministers. Yes. Uh, independent reporters uh, consider all material considerations, including valid community representations when making a planning decision on behalf of Scottish ministers. Our current planning consultation paper supports the independent panel's view uh, that appeal decision notices should clearly summarise how community views have been taken into account. Horace Golden. 
Residents in East Renfrewshire face the prospect of losing Broom Park, a cherished community green space, to development, with mental health, obesity levels and poor fitness all topics of serious concern, it would be a mistake to allow the destruction of a resource which provides opportunities for recreation, exercise and social interaction. Does the SNP government recognise these benefits to the community and what assurances can be given to the Save the Broom Park protest group that the Scottish Government will support them in opposing this development? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the member may be very well aware that as Planning Minister, I cannot comment on individual cases that may cross my desk. Um, if he is not aware of that situation, um, then I would ask him to take account of that when he formulates questions in the future. Um, can I say that in terms of his initial question, um, the figure uh, of a 25% rise in planning appealed, uh, appeals allowed is due to a misrepresentation of DPEA decisions and inclusion of work other than planning appeals. Figures for 2016-17, although obviously as yet incomplete, suggest that the percentage of appeals allowed is in line with those years for which we have complete data. Any fluctuation in the number of planning appeals where the original decision has been overturned would be significantly lower than the 25% suggested by Mr. Golden. Uh, but what I would say in terms of uh, the residents that he talks of, I would ask them to engage too uh, with the planning consultation. Uh, and I would re reiterate what I've said previously uh, in the fact that I want communities to become much more involved in the planning system at the early stages. And it's, that is the point where they should have uh, their real say rather than relying on a, the appeal system. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Further to that comment by the Minister, would the Minister agree that the focus of the Scottish Government must be on strengthening engagement in the planning system? And does the Minister recognise the benefits of a stronger early engagement can be a more positive and constructive approach? Minister. President Officer, I, I fully agree uh, that early enga engagement in the planning process is essential. Uh, and Mr Lyle is absolutely right to highlight this. Um, our current consultation sets out proposals for improving engagement, including a new right for communities to plan their own places and measures to secure more meaningful engagement from the outset in both plan and decision making. Uh, I believe that this would be much more constructive than introducing a right of appeal that's been asked for by others at the very end of the process. Question number three, Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it is confident that the UK Government will lay its commencement order in time for the Scottish Government to take forward its social security plans. Minister Jean Freeman. The Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, which comprises ministerial representatives from the Scottish Government, Scotland Office and the DWP, agreed at its last meeting on the 11th of October that the UK Government would work with the Scottish Government to transfer legislative competence by June 2017. This agreement is reflected in the published minutes of that meeting and in all of our discussions with the UK Government and DWP since then, we have been very clear that we expect this timetable to be adhered to. Assuming that the commencement order is laid on this timetable, we will then introduce our Social Security Bill to this Parliament by the end of this parliamentary year. Work on that bill is proceeding on the basis of that clear and unequivocal agreement. Claire Hockey. I thank the Minister for that answer. Does the Minister agree that it is the DWP who are responsible for the progress and delay of the relevant sections of the Scotland Act, and that as it is imperative to ensure the safe and secure transition of these powers, the DWP must take responsibility for the timetable as it stands? Minister. The, the member is right in that both governments have a role in this exercise and therefore the UK government and the DWP are wholly and solely responsible for laying the necessary commencement order which will allow the Scottish government to meet our commitment to introduce the Social Security Bill before the end of this parliamentary year. That responsibility would naturally 
extend not only to progress but also to delay. But we've not been talking to them about delay. We've been talking to them about adhering to the timetable agreed in that joint ministerial working group. That said, a safe and secure transfer of these vital benefits, one which ensures that no payment is missed and no recipient goes without, requires a large-scale programme of work to be carried out jointly by the Scottish and UK governments and the DWP. In delivering this, we will be accountable to this Parliament and the people of Scotland, and I'm sure that the UK government and the DWP accept that they are accountable for their part too. Adam Tompkins. Uh, th thank you. The Minister um, has said before that there is no delay, uh, and she talked in her answer there to uh, the member about um, adhering to the timetable. So can I ask in that context, what is the timetable for the Scottish Government to uh, publish its summary of the responses to the consultation exercise on social security? Minister. Um, we are uh, almost at the end of receiving and, and uh, looking through the independent analysis of the consultation responses uh, and drafting our response to that. And I expect to be able to publish uh, both in the coming weeks. Uh, question number four, Brian Whittle. And thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to ensure that charities and third sector organisations that support communities are appropriately resourced. Min uh, sorry, Cabinet Secretary Angela Conson. Presiding Officer, charities and third sector organisations play a crucial role in supporting our communities and are absolutely key to driving forward social justice and inclusive economic growth. The third sector has access to resources through a range of programmes right across the government and funding for the core third sector budget in 2017-18 will be protected at the 2016-17 level of £24.5 million. Pounds. Brian Whittle. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, while visiting and speaking to third sector organisations whose services are crucial in the community, the major concern that consistently gets raised is one of ongoing funding. These organisations in my area, like Ad Action, who work with alcohol and drug addiction, or WG13, who give second chances to young people looking to develop work and life skills, or Centre Stage, or the Holiday Project, and many, many more, they are much better placed to deal with community issues than the central government. With an ever-decreasing pot to apply to and the declining resource of the big lottery, will the Scottish Government consider how it can best support these vital community resources and look at how it can influence the length of term of any funding to allow proper planning and stability for both service users and providers? After all, how effectively could, effectively could we do our roles if we needed to seek annual re-election? Shudder, shudder. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I uh, firstly would like to thank Mr Whittle uh, for his supplementary question because unlike his equality spokesperson uh, a few weeks ago, he has taken the opportunity to advocate and champion the role of the third sector. And we all, in our day-to-day -day jobs, uh, rely on the third sector uh, who are very often at the front of uh, tackling poverty and inequality uh, in our country. And the point he makes about the need uh, for longer term security for funding is indeed well made. Uh, we have a manifesto commitment about making it far easier and simpler uh, for the voluntary and third sector to access funding. And we're also looking at three year role in funding uh, where appropriate. And the point uh, he makes uh, about the voluntary sector having a reach, a reach into communities uh, that the otherwise uh, statutory agencies struggle um, to be as effective on. So I welcome his endorsement uh, and praise and support of the charities in third sector. And I really hope uh, that some of his colleagues uh, can learn by his example. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Scottish Government has no intention of introducing an anti-advocacy clause, as the UK Government has already done, which restricts the activities and campaigns of charities and third sector organisations? 
Uh, yes, President Officer, uh, I can confirm that the Scottish Government has absolutely no intention of introducing an anti-advocacy clause, uh, as the UK Government has done. Uh, charities and the third sector have been part of shaping Scotland uh, for many years. Uh, they bring an insight and perspective uh, to public policy, and we make absolutely uh, no apologies uh, for operating in such a way to enable uh, our partners in third sector organisations to participate in policy development and to provide uh, honest challenge uh, where that is important. The value or one of the strengths of the third sector is that they are not afraid to speak truth to power. That isn't always comfortable uh, for governments, uh, but it's part of who we seek to be. And we have absolutely no wish to deter uh, this important part of the democratic process. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the fantastic work done um, in third sector and voluntary organisations um, by advocacy and advice workers on income maximisations. Um, those organisations are reliant on um, local government for £8.75 million pounds worth of funding to provide those uh, vital services. How does the Cabinet Secretary feel the £327 million pounds worth of cuts to local government? is going to impact on income maximisation, advice and advocacy in the third sector, given the reliance on local government funding? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the reality is that at its very heart and at its very core, this government has tackling uh, inequality and poverty and the, the systemic uh, disadvantage that uh, you know, exists uh, structurally uh, in our uh, economy. Uh, I believe local government have been given a, a fair uh, offer and when you consider uh, the additional resources put into education uh, and health and social care, uh, we will see an additional uh, investment in services and on the front line. But in terms of Mr Griffin's uh, actually very important point about the role of advice services uh, in income maximisation, uh, I do endorse that. Uh, across the piece, across government, we are investing uh, in the region between 40 and 50 million pounds uh, into advice services. There are some uh, very uh, specific funds uh, for advice services that are indeed very focused on uh, income uh, maximisation. And also, uh, as a government, we announced at the beginning of uh, the year um, a new fund, the uh, £29 million uh, fund, uh, the Aspiring Communities Fund. That's one uh, tranche uh, of uh, money that has been uh, matched with the European Social Fund. So there are many sources of funding and it's our job to ensure that we get maximum uh, impact on that because the point about income maximisation is well made and is very often uh, the key to unlocking uh, disadvantage and indeed discrimination. Question number five, Patrick Harvey. Thank you very much. Can I ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Time for Inclusive Education campaign pledge, which calls for LGBTI inclusive education? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, Ministers recognise that these are concerning issues and are indeed committed to understanding more fully uh, the current experiences and views of children and young people in schools. Uh, the Scottish Government will continue to work with all our key stakeholders, including TAI, Stonewall Scotland and LGBT Youth Scotland, to address uh, these very real uh, concerns. It is important uh, to better understand the relationship in particular between mental health issues and bullying, uh, and in particular the impact on LGBTI young people. And we will take action to address this, including commissioning research if appropriate. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I uh, take on a, a, a matter of trust the fact that the government has goodwill on these issues. And I hope that the government understands there is goodwill from across the political spectrum on these issues as well. Given that the 40-plus uh, MSPs who have signed the campaign pledge represent members of all political parties, uh, I hope we can agree that it's something we can make substantial progress on together. Uh, the, the campaign pledges include some things that could I think be done relatively quickly and straightforwardly. For example, monitoring inclusion activity in schools uh, and ensuring uh, that bullying is properly recorded and developing teacher training materials. I would hope that all five elements, uh, including curricular inclusion, can be made, uh, can achieve progress in the, the near future. Given the level of political support and the breadth of it for this campaign, 
Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to give a full written response in detail to the campaign pledges, uh, and can she indicate how long it will take for the Government to produce that kind of response? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so I thank Mr Harvey uh, for the, the tone and tenor uh, of his question. Uh, I will indeed uh, supply uh, a full uh, written response. It is appropriate that I do that in partnership with the Deputy First Minister, uh, our Education uh, Secretary uh, as well. Um, he will be aware from the comments that the First Minister made only a few weeks ago uh, that the Government and, and Ministers were supporters uh, of the Thai campaign. The First Minister made crystal clear uh, our commitment and determination to take forward uh, the issues uh, identified. We do indeed need to move from uh, words uh, to deeds and there are some early actions uh, taken by the Deputy First Minister uh, in terms of the delivery plan for education uh, with time, time scales to report back uh, for uh, this year. As a government, we are uh, considering uh, our, our options. Uh, how we achieve uh, what we all want, which is a better experience, better support and better outcomes uh, for young people, we have to give that uh, you know, serious consideration about how we achieve in the context of how our current uh, education uh, system uh, currently uh, operates. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there are great opportunities uh, for early action, uh, and I, as the Equalities uh, Secretary, am particularly interested uh, in the issues uh, around monitoring and reporting. And I'm aware that there have been many, uh, there's been a survey from Thai, Stonewall Scotland, uh, the health survey about uh, bullying and behaviour in schools. Uh, and, you know, that to me perhaps points to a need to more comprehensive uh, research, but comprehensive research with the purpose uh, of a springboard for action. But nonetheless, we need to look at uh, where uh, we can quickly move uh, from words to deeds. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary will know, all schools must pursue an anti-bullying strategy. And as many of us will recall from our own school days, children can be bullied because of their appearance, ethnicity, the way they speak, and a host of other reasons. Does she agree that schools must rigorously oppose the bullying of any pupil, regardless of the cause, wherever and whenever it occurs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, Mr. President, officer, the Scottish Government has to take bullying in all its forms uh, very seriously. Bullying of any kind, including homophobic, biphobic uh, and transphobic uh, bullying is, uh, of course, unacceptable and has to be addressed uh, swiftly and effectively whenever and wherever it arises. And children and young people, you know, they have to feel uh, safe, happy and respected and included uh, in their learning environment. Uh, and all staff, you know, have to be proactive in promoting that uh, positive relationships and behaviour in the classroom and the playground and indeed beyond in the, in the wider uh, learning community. Uh, so we will publish a refreshed uh, anti-bullying uh, guidance later in the year once the Deputy First Minister has had the opportunity to carefully consider uh, all the points that will be raised by the, the Scottish Parliament's Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Question number six, Anas Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government when carers' allowance will be increased for carers in Glasgow. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. Increasing carers' allowance to the same level as job seekers' allowance, providing an additional £600 a year to carers, is one of the key commitments we've made in respect of our new social security powers and reflects the recognition we give to carers who make such an important contribution to our society. We are in active discussions with the Department for Work and Pensions to assess options for delivery ahead of the new Social Security Agency being fully operational. At this point, it is not possible to confirm exact timescales. I thank the Minister for the answer. I agree wholeheartedly in the policy to increase carers' allowance to the same level as job seekers' allowance, that will benefit carers who sacrifice uh, their own lives to care for others. Uh, 11,000 carers in my own region of Glasgow. And the Minister is right to suggest that a £600 increase will be a lifeline for many, many carers and a £6 million boost for carers in the city of Glasgow alone. The reality is that the powers for this top-up came in September 2016, and I think carers across the country deserve a direct answer on when we can expect that increase to take place. It's one thing demanding powers, it's a second thing getting the power, it's a third actually delivering justice and fairness for people who deserve that extra support. Minister. Well, I'm glad the member recognises that there are stages in this exercise. We've been around this a few times in this chamber, and the stages in this exercise are that the 
uh, UK government has to lay the commencement order. We have to bring the bill to the parliament. We then have to establish our own social security agency to deliver at our own hand the increases and the changes and improvements to the 11 benefits that will be devolved to us that we intend to do. In advance of that, we rely on the DWP to make any changes that we might wish to make in the interim. I've just explained to the member that we are in active discussions with the DWP around their capacity to deliver any increase to the carers allowance in advance of us working through the proper stages to secure the safe and secure transfer of benefits to uh, this government. That is our, a, an indication of our recognition of the importance of the commitment that we've made to carers and of our intent to try and do that sooner than we have the agency uh, to deliver the, it for ourselves. But at this point, I cannot give a timescale because those discussions are ongoing. And as I made clear in an earlier answer, at this stage and throughout this exercise, this is a joint exercise between this government and the UK government and the DWP. And we need the DWP to be able to deliver this for us at this point, just as we uh, have agreed with them how they will deliver the flexibilities in universal credit that I was very pleased to announce a couple of weeks ago. Question number seven, Marie Todd. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what role it considers charities and the third sector play in helping people and creating an equal and fairer society. Cabinet Secretary. Deciding officer, the third sector are a pillar of our society and are at the forefront of our drive to tackle poverty and inequality in Scotland. We should be very proud that there are over 45,000 third sector organisations operating in Scotland and over a quarter uh, of our population uh, volunteer. Many play their part in building a better and fairer Scotland for us all uh, and that's why I have, as I said earlier, protected the third sector budget at the 2016-17 level of £24.5 million uh, to maximise the impact of the sector in reducing disadvantage and inequality, uh, working with communities to tackle uh, tough social issues issues at source. Marie Todd. I thank you for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that a recent comment piece by the Tories' own equality spokesperson, which gave credence to a tabloid investigation full of inaccuracies, or fake news as some people might call it, um, was utter and, and revealed the Tories' preference to restrict the activities and campaigns of Scotland's charities was utterly shameful? and that we should instead celebrate the important role that the third sector plays in highlighting policy issues and providing a voice on public policy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, presiding officer. I uh, personally found uh, some of the stories that appeared in the press uh, offensive uh, and disrespectful to the thousands of staff and volunteers who work very hard for charitable uh, causes up and down the country. Of course, uh, you know, press and journalists are absolutely uh, free to say and do as they wish. I wouldn't want to uh, interfere with that in any way. I suppose I was somewhat disappointed uh, that a member uh, of this chamber and those uh, uh, across there uh, aided and betted what I perceive to be a slur uh, on an entire uh, sector. And we all know that as MSPs right across this chamber that we have benefited and no doubt have used and quoted uh, from the briefings, uh, information, policy work and evidence to committees that has been provided uh, by our very uh, vibrant third sector. Our third sector uh, provide value for money and they punch above their weight. They are, I repeat, a pillar uh, of our democratic and transparent society. They are not afraid to speak truth to power to whoever uh, is in power and they are at the forefront uh, of community-led action to tackle uh, poverty and inequality. Jamie Green. Uh, a report uh, published yesterday by the veterans mental health charity Combat Stress uh, highlighted that Scottish veterans are much more likely to end up living in deprived areas compared to ex-service men and women in the rest of the UK. In the sample of 3,000 ex-service personnel, over half were found to be living in some of the most deprived areas of Scotland. Can I ask the Minister what action the Scottish Government might take to work with charities and the third sector to ensure that our veterans are equipped with the uh, adequate uh, resources they need to meet the complex challenges they face when they leave the military. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and again, and I welcome uh, that question from Mr Green. I am a, a former uh, prison uh, social worker um, and often on my caseload there were um, ex-squaddies uh, who had experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, had uh, abused drugs and alcohol, had committed uh, an offence. And as a backbencher in this parliament, I had led a debate and uh, did some work with stakeholders that looked at the over-representation um, of uh, ex-veterans uh, within our mental health system and indeed uh, within uh, our veterans, um, uh, within our um, prison system uh, as well. So the point he raises is, is very important. Uh, and he rightly points to, to the evidence uh, that came to our attention uh, yesterday. So as a government, we have Keith Brown, uh, who has a responsibility over and above uh, being economy secretary uh, as the, the veterans uh, cabinet secretary, as a champion for veterans. But we must remember that we also have to work very closely uh, with the MOD, who have a responsibility, like we all do, for those uh, who have given their utmost to serve their country and that we have to continue to care for them when their active service uh, is over. Because if we don't, that creates um, extreme ramifications, not just for individuals, uh, but you know, for families uh, and uh, for communities. And if there's further information uh, that I can provide the member through the work we're doing in the third sector, I'm happy uh, to provide that. But there will also be other colleagues uh, across this government uh, that will share with him the endeavour to do far more uh, for our veterans. Question number eight, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that the planning system will drive forward regeneration and promote long term economic growth. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you. Planning has a key role to play in de delivering Scotland's economic strategy. Uh, the importance of the role of planning in supporting regeneration and long-term e economic growth runs through the proposals in our current planning consultation. Supporting sustainable economic growth and regeneration uh, and the creation of well-designed sustainable places is one of the four outcomes which support the Scottish Government's vision for the planning system. Rona Mackay. Thank you for that answer. Um, can the Minister set out how Scotland's planners can empower our communities and provide a stable environment for investment through the uncertain times that we live in? Minister. Thank you. Uh, we want Scotland's planning system to empower people. Uh, we've invested in tools like the PLACE standard, uh, which provides a framework for communities to get involved in the planning process. Uh, use of the PLACE standard is a, an excellent opportunity for people of all ages uh, to take part in conversations uh, about the quality and the future of their places. Our, our proposals on long-term spatial planning and the delivery of infrastructure and housing will provide a secure environment for growth investment. But beyond that, as I've said in earlier answers, uh, what I want to see is communities involved in planning the length and breadth of Scotland and that incorporation of community planning and spatial planning. And I think that is extremely important. Uh, and like to every other uh, member who has asked questions uh, on this issue today, presiding officer, uh, I would uh, encourage uh, Ms. Mackay to get as many of her constituents as possible to respond to the current planning review. Question number nine, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government what funding and support it provides to projects that aim to tackle inequalities? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, in October 2016, the Scottish Government published its Fairer Scotland Action Plan to create a more socially just society, and a number of budgets across government provide support to tackle inequality. For example, the Social Justice and Regeneration Budget allows us to deliver a range of actions to achieve social justice, including £3.6 million to support advice and advocacy services, £1 million to tackle food poverty as well. There is also the Community Empowerment Scotland Act and the Empowering Communities Fund at £20 million, which empowers local people and helps community to uh, deliver action and to tackle uh, poverty and inequality. Uh, in addition to that, the equality budget at £20 million supports activity to promote equality um, across a range of protected characteristics. And there was a recently announced funding of £29 million, which will support communities and third sector organisations to develop new ways uh, to help help people overcome disadvantage within their own communities. Richard Lockhead. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. And in terms of tackling health inequalities, she will be aware of the Eat Canny project. 
in Murray, which is a project run by four local charities, Community Food Murray, Elgin Youth Development Group, REAP and Transition Town Forest. And they've carried out over 200 cooking classes and many other initiatives to help make people access easier, healthy eating in their own communities. And their funding is due to run out in March of this year, but I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary agrees it's really important they continue their good work. And I know that various Cabinet Secretaries have various funds which could potentially help this kind of project to continue in our communities throughout Scotland. And I wonder if you'd be willing to have our officials to look at what help may be made available to the Eat Canny project so they can continue their good work uh, in the Murray communities, just like some of our initiatives are doing elsewhere in the country. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, President Officer, I am aware of the uh, excellent work uh, undertaken by Eat Canny and the work they do in particular to tackle uh, health inequalities uh, through food. Uh, Mr Lockhead is right, there is a, a range of uh, alternative uh, funding uh, resources. Uh, for example, the Aspiring uh, Communities Fund will provide support to communities to work collaboratively uh, with partners uh, to accelerate the design and delivery of, I stress, community-led initiatives uh, that tackle uh, poverty, uh, inequality and exclusion. And there's also uh, Community Food and Health Scotland, uh, which is funded uh, by the Scottish Government, which provides a range of advice and support uh, to groups uh, in this area, including you know, things like practice development, you know, community retail and nutrition uh, and cooking uh, classes, as well as uh, running annual development funds. But I can, of course, uh, write to the member uh, with, with, with more detail on all of that and across government too. Question 10 has been withdrawn. Question 11, Pauline McNeill. Presenting officer to ask the Scottish Government how it supports food banks. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, we believe access to sufficient uh, nutritious food is a, a basic human right uh, and that no one in a nation as rich as Scotland should uh, have to access food banks. Uh, that's why uh, we've established the £1 million a year fair food fund to support the development of approaches that support people affected uh, by food poverty in a dignified, sustainable way uh, that reduces reliance on emergency food aid. The Fair Food Transformation Fund, which is a subset of the Fair Food Fund, uh, supports 36 projects, uh, 14 of which are food banks, which are adapting their model to provide uh, more dignified responses. I've had recently a, a very pro, uh, productive meeting with Trussell Trust uh, in which we discussed key areas where we could work together, uh, including supporting the Trussell Trust to carry out some key research into food poverty. Polly McNeill. Presiding officer, um, I'd like to put on record my thanks too to the Trussell Trust for educating me and a number of MSPs in this parliament about the wonderful work that all food banks do which have become necessary in today's world. And importantly, many food banks now go beyond the role of ensuring that people don't starve in today's society and provide a wider advocacy role. Would the minister uh, outline whether there is a government policy and the long-term use of food banks necessary, though they are now? I suppose in the long term, we would really would want to see progress towards um, ensuring that they're not a necessary part of society. Uh, would the minister, minister further consider an all-party meeting just to discuss the long-term use of food banks and perhaps um, get an understanding of the wider approach that the government are taking to funding them, giving them a much wider role that they seem to now be playing? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, President Officer, I'm always happy to meet with the member and indeed others uh, to discuss you know, our long-term approach to both uh, tackling uh, the causes and consequences uh, of uh, food poverty. I'm sure the member is aware um, of the work that was done by the Short Life uh, Working Group on Food Poverty that produced the report Dignity uh, Ending Hunger Together uh, in, in Scotland. And you know, we very much based um, our, our policy and approach uh, on the work that they have done in and around the, the, the Fair Food uh, principles uh, which have to have you know dignity at their very heart about opportunities for service users to be involved uh, and you know having a real say in how services are delivered with other opportunities to volunteer or to uh, upskill but of course we all have to be in the business of finding ways to eradicate the need for food banks as opposed to them becoming uh, normalised. Uh, and in terms of the work that we've done today with the, the Short Life Working Group, we're focused on moving from food charity uh, to food uh, justice. Uh, and there's a number of uh, areas that we're pursuing to, to achieve that, but always happy to discuss in more detail. Stuart McMillan. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Actually, I agree with uh, much of the comments that Paul McNeill actually said a few moments ago. But uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the UK Government maladministration of benefits, welfare cuts and benefit sanctions have continually pushed more and more people into food poverty and increased the demand in a number of food banks in Scotland and that this is a shocking trend that really does need to stop? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, that would be um, my, my view as a Scottish Government Minister, but it's also the view of the uh, independent third sector who are pointing to very clear uh, evidence that the current benefit, conditionality and sanctions regime is neither fair nor uh, proportionate. Uh, and both Scottish Government and uh, stakeholders have been highlighting uh, the negative impact on individuals across Scotland uh, as a result of sanctions. And we're clear that sanctions have been a major uh, driver uh, to food banks. And according to the most recent figures from uh, the Trussell uh, Trust, uh, the number of people seeking assistance from food banks continues to rise uh, with the issues uh, around benefits accounting for 44% uh, of referrals. So I am clear that food poverty is a symptom of wider poverty and that the UK government's welfare cuts and punitive sanctions regime are pushing more and more people into acute uh, income crisis. And this is a shameful situation in an advanced and successful country and economy such as ours. Yeah. Thank you. Apologies to members for not getting through very many questions there. We now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by Annabel Ewing on a review of legal aid. And we'll just take a few seconds to change seats.